welcome to Think Like a Pancreas, the podcast, where our goal is to keep you informed, inspired, and a little entertained on all things diabetes. The information contained in this program is based on the experience and opinions and wisdom of the Integrated Diabetes Services clinical team. Given the individualized nature of diabetes care, any changes to your treatment plan should be discussed with your personal health care provider. I'm your host, Gary Shiner, owner and clinical director of Integrated Diabetes Services. And today we're going to be talking about sports and diabetes and whether glucose control really makes a difference when exercising. And I'm really delighted to be joined today by Catherine Gentili Alvarez. Uh, Catherine is our director of exercise physiology and teen and young adult programming at Integrated Diabetes Services. She has a master's in exercise physiology and is a certified diabetes care and education specialist. Man, we were happy when she got that certification. Uh, she's also certified by the American College of Sports Medicine and the International Sports Science Association. And she's had type one diabetes since she was a little 12 year old. So welcome, Catherine. Um, I'd love to know a little bit about your own personal sports history and what kind of things you've done athletically and, and what you do to stay in shape these days. All right. Well, I'm happy to be here. <clears throat> My um, favorite thing for physical activity right now is definitely walking or jogging with my dog on the beach. Um, and that's in addition, I do a lot of strength training too. Um, and do a lot of bike riding here in Florida. It's the perfect place for that. Um, growing up, my main sport, which some people argue it's not a sport, but it definitely is, uh, was cheerleading. So I started that when I was in third grade and I did that all the way through college. Um, so I did both competitive and recreational cheerleading. Um, I did some what do you Go tell ahead. people who say, ah, oh, that's not a sport. Anyone can do that. Well, it's going to be in the Olympics soon. So I think that's going to be really helpful to the argument. Um, and actually, there's a documentary that came out a few years ago called Cheer. And I think that helped a lot with people's perspective on on what cheerleading entails. Have you watched it? Uh, no, I haven't seen it. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, unacceptable. You need to watch it immediately. <laughs> From your own perspective, uh, how, how in shape do you have to be to cheer successfully? Well, I mean, it, like any sport, it, there's all different levels to it. So for like my school team and cheering at like football games, soccer games, um, it didn't require too much of like too much athleticism, um, definitely need to be able to jump and have some stamina. Um, but the competitive cheerleading is really where the difficulty level can get up there. Um, you're doing routines that are two minutes and 30 seconds of nonstop go where you're throwing people in the air and doing um, what we call stunts and you're flipping. So which is called tumbling and uh, you have the jumps and dance. And so it's a, it's a, yeah, definitely a tough thing to do. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound any easier. It's probably even harder than putting a ball in a hoop or a puck in a goal or you know, any other sport. Uh, yeah, definitely. It definitely is. <laughs> yeah. So before we talk about you know, specifics around glucose management, can you tell us in more kind of general terms, what do you feel the role is that physical fitness plays? in living well with diabetes? Well, you know, as an exercise physiologist, and you are too, Gary, um, I can make the argument that exercise is one of the most important things in diabetes management. Um, we have so many benefits from it uh, that it's going to help with, but it can also make a lot of things more difficult too. So the education around how to manage blood sugar around sport and activity is really important. Um, but the main things are, it's gonna reduce the risk for heart disease, nerve damage, um, it's gonna improve insulin sensitivity, which can make 
diabetes, navigating it a lot easier in many ways. Uh, it helps with anxiety, depression, so, so much mental health things that um, we have extra burden to in life with type one diabetes. So the insulin sensitivity part, I can definitely relate to. If I miss a workout just one day, my sugars start to go up. I miss two days, they go up more. And mm -hmm. unless I've got a, you know, I'm sick or I've got like three broken limbs, I never go more than a day without working out. So I don't get to that two day mark very often. Uh, but yeah, that it, it's a major thing. It definitely influences our ability to control our glucose levels. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it could be the difference of having to change like your sights out before they expire, mm -hmm. adding activity in. You can, like, if you're on the Omnipod, and make oh, it muscle. My, my pump runs out of insulin when I'm not working out. So I have to right. change it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, let's flip it around. And rather than talking about the effect of exercise on blood sugar, let's talk about the effect of blood sugar on exercise. How do you feel glucose levels affect performance in sports and fitness activities? Or does it have an effect? Does it matter? Definitely. It does matter. Um, and there's not enough research on this. This That is for sure. Uh, there is, I don't know, I think I've only read one study and that's all I've come across. Have you come across more than that? Yeah, there is a dearth of really good research on the impact of glucose levels on specific yeah. performance parameters. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. There's such an opportunity for research in that area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I mean, just in myself and talking to so many other people, with type one diabetes, we find that the high blood sugars definitely seem to slow us down. And I, I like to call it like a lag, mm. uh, high blood sugars make it feel like almost like we're lagging It makes your body almost feel like heavier and you can't move as quickly. You can't respond as quickly to the things going on around you. Um, and then hypoglycemia, you have, and then you're going to have to sit out. So um, and I think everyone has a different number or range of blood sugars where they're going to perform their best. I don't think it's the same for everybody. I think that some people will be able to have great performance with a blood sugar that other people would get that kind of lag high blood sugar feeling with. So. Yeah, I know when I play basketball that when my glucose is in a decent range, and for me, it's like low to mid hundreds, mm -hmm. I, I perform better and I feel better mood wise. Um, my reaction times are better. My stamina, the stamina part is enormous. I find when yeah. sugars are running even a little bit on the high side, my stamina is just not good. I, run in, I hit that wall. I just get tired a lot easier. Mm -hmm. You find that to be, to be the case? Yep. It's the same, same exact thing for me. I just cannot, I can't move as quickly. Um, and like for cheerleading, uh, this was a really hard thing for me to navigate when I was first diagnosed was I have cheerleading competitions and get like that adrenaline rise. So my blood sugar would be really high going into it. And I would touch down in my tumbling, which means like you kind of, you like fall out of it. You don't land it. Um, I never understood why that was happening, but it was so much harder for me to do at that point. And now I know why years later. But. Yeah. It seems like fine motor skills are influenced by glucose levels. And it, it's hard to know exactly what the mechanism of action is. I mean, we know that mm -hmm. glucose competes uh, for spaces on red blood cells with oxygen. So the ability to deliver oxygen quickly and efficiently is affected when glucose levels are even temporarily elevated. The whole mind-body connection seems to be influenced. But I, I like the word lag that you used. Uh, I, I always, I feel like I just ate a whole Thanksgiving turkey with my sugar side. Yeah, definitely. With gravy, with all the accoutrement, the stuffing, the potatoes, the whole nine yards. You just feel like a big slug. Yeah. Slug-like feeling. And that's no way to perform. You know, the, the athletes that I've worked with over the years, whether they're 
amateur, semi-pro, pro, you know, athletes for whom performance is really critical for their, you know, it's, it's their way of living. Um, they see the difference and they, they recognize even subtle differences in their glucose levels impact things. Uh, yeah. A lot of them find once they start getting up to close to 180 and higher, that's when performance starts to suffer. You know, and that, that co corresponds with when we start spilling sugar in the urine. So dehydration begins to occur and the energy that we would normally burn during exercise may not be readily available. Mm -hmm. So I always feel that staying under 180 is a worthwhile endeavor while exercising and just being, you know, close, as close to normal as possible. Yeah. And I totally agree with that, which is why it's so shocking that so many people still think that you need to go into a workout with a high blood sugar. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So definitely that is old, old strategies to be utilizing, especially with what we've learned and the new technologies that we have. Yeah. So I just got off the phone with a mom a little while ago whose son plays baseball. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to convince her of that. And she says, now my Johnny's got to be up there really high or he's going to go low while he's playing. What do you tell someone like that? Well, what can they do to prevent a low without starting high? Well, a big thing is, I mean, it really depends on what system they're using. A lot of people are now on hybrid closed loop systems, and that's exactly what they do. They get their blood sugar high before they go in, and then they put it on like activity mode that the hybrid closed loop system has. But what they don't understand is the hybrid closed loop system is still delivering them insulin in the background. And for example, the tandem, it's not reducing their insulin sensitivity factor if they're using their normal profile. So they can wind up with a decent amount of insulin on board. And we know that when you're physically active, you don't need as much of that corrective insulin to bring your blood sugar down. So all of that extra insulin given from the system is going to tank them down. Yeah, and any system, whether it's Omnipod 5 or Medtronic or Tandem or even the uh, open source, the DIY type systems, you can temporarily raise the target glucose and go into your workout with blood sugars that you know, aren't quite as tight as usual, but it does still doesn't guarantee anything. You know, you can still wind up low if you're working out hard enough and long enough. Yeah. Well, what, do you, okay. what do you recommend for keeping glucose levels from dropping significantly during a workout session? Well, you have to look at a lot of the different variables. Um, are they having a meal beforehand? Um, because if they're having a meal, um, something that a lot of people don't realize is digestion slows down significantly with physical activity. Actually, a lot of people think it's reversed, hmm. uh, but digestion slows down and your insulin starts working extra well. So when food isn't really impacting your blood sugar, but the insulin's working extra well, there's like a guaranteed crash right there. Um, so that time day and the food timing is a big thing to take into consideration for it. If you need to, carb supplementation is an option too. Um, so what I recommend if you're going to do carb supplementation, you, it has to be a very fast acting high glycemic index carbohydrate. Um, my top recommendation is getting the Gatorade powder mixing the Gatorade powder with just a little bit of water so that you don't have to consume a lot of it. And you're almost taking like a shot of high carb Gatorade. What does uh, that taste like? It, it doesn't taste great, but oh. it's so quick and efficient. You don't have like the chalkiness or the like gel stuff, which is so gross. Um, does it get gritty when you don't have enough water in there though? Oh, no, you gotta mix it. Well, you got those, uh, the, uh, you just, blender bottles. You just chug the powder with, with a little bit of water. Yeah. Wow. That's hardcore, Catherine. Athletes don't mind it. They're like dry scooping their pre-workout and stuff. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> dry scooping. Is that a yeah. technical term? Dry scooping? Yes, it is. It's like rage bolus. It's one of those technical yeah. words we come up with. Okay. Yeah. But if somebody does, uh, choose to exercise or has to do it after a meal time, uh, I assume we're going to cut back on the bolus insulin to prevent that yeah. drop. Yeah. And that 
is another important thing for people to think about when they're using hybrid closed loop systems. What a lot of people will do is they enter in the true amount of carb that they're having, and then they manually reduce the bolus. So for example, like let's say they're having 40 grams of carb. They type in 40 and for easy math, they have a one to 10 insulin to carb ratio. So base, assuming their blood sugar is in normal range, you're going to get a four unit bolus recommendation from the system. They delete the four unit and enter in two. So they're reducing it by 50%, but they told their system that they were having 40 grams of carbohydrate. So your hybrid closed loop system is like, well, you had 40 grams of carb and that your settings tell us you need four units of insulin for that, but you only gave two. So eh, we'll just make up the difference and crank it in the background. So you have to actually, this is like the, one of the few times where you lie to your system, you tell it you're having less than what you're actually having, and then cover it that yeah. way. Yeah, with DIY, you know, it, it does consider your food entries in its you know, un insulin adjustments. The other systems don't usually consider that. So you can basically just change the bolus. Although I think in Medtronic, you can't adjust the bolus that it recommends. So you have to lie to it with the carb entry. Mm -hmm. Just put yep. half as much in. But yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, do you ever recommend using an extended delivery before a workout? So the insulin works a little slower? I would not say extended, um, more split bolusing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if they are having that meal, they're going to have that digestion impact. You don't want the extended bolus insulin hitting mm -hmm. during the workout. Uh, I like to do a split bolus because then you know, right, or, or my workout's about to come to an end. That food impact is going to start happening again on blood sugar. So about eh, 10 or so minutes before the workout ends, you go ahead and enter in some more of those carbs that were consumed, okay. prevent that back end rise. All right. And you know, you any other time of day, you, like you said, you can use rapid acting carbs to prevent a low. Uh, do you recommend consuming that right before the activity begins or a little in advance? A little bit in advance. Um, so you need some time for it to, to impact blood sugar mm -hmm. and depending on where it is on the glycemic index. So what people want to consume, if it's like moderate glycemic index, you're going to have to have it a little further in advance, give it time to impact blood sugar. If it's high glycemic index, well, it's going to very rapidly in increase blood sugar. So. Yeah. I know people that eat things like granola bars that have nuts and whatever in them, they got to eat that well in it well ahead of time. Yep, they definitely uh, need more time for that. Whereas if it's one of those like cereal bar things that digest almost instantly, they can have that right beforehand. Yep. Uh, sure. Is there anything about the continuous glucose monitors that people need to be aware of while they're exercising? Is it is it reliable? Uh, do you have to assume there's more lag time, anything like that? Yep, you sure do. So um, physical activity, more lag time tend not to be as accurate as well. So um, definitely if blood sugar goes low, ideally you're checking with the meter to see if you're back in range or if you're someone whose symptoms you can trust most slow, you can kind of use that too, to gauge. I've actually need. told some people to set their, change their low alert while they're exercising, set it a little bit higher Yeah, that's uh, good idea. because of that, you know, prolong longer than usual lag time. Uh, mm -hmm. That way they can truly catch it before it goes into a true hypo range. Yeah, especially um, for runners, it's a good idea. Yeah, distance type stuff. Yeah. So let's think about the other extreme now, which are the high sugars that sometimes occur, especially with competitive sports. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of strategies can people use to keep their sugars from running much too high during a workout? So, and this, this is so tough for people because you tell them to give, you tell them these strategies and they're like, before exercise, what? Um, but as you said, uh, exercise because of the hormones that our bodies are producing can increase blood sugar. So the, a good starting point strategy, I learned this from you, of course, Gary, which I've learned mm -hmm. everything from, is to <laughs> deliver. So you're going to assume your blood sugar is going to rise, kind of figure out where it's typically rising to. 
and you're going to give yourself about 50% of your normal corrective insulin beforehand, trusting, you know, that rise is going to come and then you can prevent it because mm -hmm. you deliver that bolus, but you need to make sure you reduce it because you're still, even though you're getting those hormones that are increasing blood sugar, you'll still be more sensitive because of the movement. Yeah. It's really, it's again, it's thinking like a pancreas. You know, normally if somebody's producing a ton of adrenaline, they'd make a little bit of insulin along with that mm -hmm. to deal with the immediate glucose influx into the bloodstream. Have you ever seen people uh, try different forms of like relaxation techniques to prevent the adrenaline surge from happening? Yeah. And I think that's becoming more and more popular, but in, when it comes down to it, there's, you, you can't prevent it altogether. Like, even if you're doing a relaxation thing before a, um, before you go up to bat for a baseball game, I think you can't really do like meditation as you're, as you're hitting. And I think there's still be at least somewhat of, of an impact. Yeah. But I guess leading up to participation, it's, it's that lead up time that I think is really gets real people. problem. Yeah. People start thinking, you know, I've got this gymnastics meet in an hour or I've got a game in you know two hours or um, we, we got a cheer competition later today. It's that anticipation I think does it to a lot of people. Yeah. Learning how to, how to relax, uh, pace breathing, meditation, yoga, things like that. I imagine that uh, could help a lot of people to just blunt that adrenaline rush they would otherwise get. Yeah. I mean, and same with just like warming up your body and um, cooling it down too, just warming yourself up for what you're about to do. Mm -hmm. What did you used to do before a cheer competition to get yourself ready? Um, well, I definitely did not... Uh, relieve my stress hormones i <laughs> <laughs> high levels of stress beforehand uh adrenaline levels were definitely through the roof but um the process is you kind of you go into warm-ups and then you hit the competition floor and warm-ups is really where i would see my blood sugar start to rise um and actually at that time i didn't do anything because i didn't know there was something to do it wasn't until college that I read Think Like a Pancreas and I learned why my blood sugars were always going up at competition time. I didn't even think like, oh, maybe I should just give myself some insulin. Hmm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and just as a reminder, I mean, athletes at any level uh, can benefit from some expert counseling and coaching. And mm -hmm. we're all available here at Integrated Diabetes to provide that. So young athletes, middle, old age, whatever, um, if you're looking to perform at your best in your chosen sport or exercise activity, uh, we can help you manage your glucose levels optimally. And yeah, that well, and that's the big thing that you have to think about is every single person is different. So even if you're doing the same sport, you're going to need to make a different adjustment than every single other person. I don't think anyone needs the exact same strategy. So yeah, for me, I, it varies by time of day. If I could do the same form of exercise in the morning or the evening and get completely different glucose uh, effects, those morning workouts hardly change my blood sugar one bit. Yep, Late I in love the day, it. it comes down in a great deal. Mm -hmm. Why does that happen? What is it about the early morning that uh, changes the, the, the glucose Level. Well, you know, we were talking about those hormones. So we have more hormone production in the morning. Um, and then we're also breaking a fast, which causes some more insulin resistance. So um, a lot of people, um, if you think about like their basal settings or their insulin to carb ratio, most people have their most aggressive basal setting and insulin to carb ratio in the morning because of the fact that they, a lot of people call it foot to floor or dawn phenomenon. Mm -hmm. and you get out of bed, your body is producing lots of hormones and blood sugar goes up and up and up. So if you're in that fasted state and you go into a workout, you have no insulin on board, you have that hormone production. So much less likely to go low. Makes a lot of sense. Well, I mean, it sounds like you probably have your blood sugars under 
under a great control. And is there anything about living with diabetes that you still struggle with? Well, technology definitely um, messes us up sometimes. I think that's the big thing that really gets me. Uh, loss of connection to Dexcom is really common. So um, I'm out and about and I have a, you know, I'm not getting readings anymore. So that doesn't help things. Definitely knocking devices off. I think I do that a lot. <laughs> Uh, well, you're you're a little klutzier than most people. Yeah, definitely am. <laughs> so I run into doorways and, you know, <laughs> especially in the summer months, though, when I'm in the water and stuff a lot, they just slide right off. Mm. So. And then bad absorb absorbing sites because mm. I wear an insulin pump, I wear the pod. Um, so a lot of times I just kind of have that insulin just kind of pocketed at the top of the skin. Cause I have more inflammation at the site. And so what's you your a good strategy for handling that? Um, well, I, there's certain places that I've learned are more likely to, for that to happen with. So if I use those places, I have to change it on day two instead of day three. Um, so that would be my arms. My arms just get lumps. Uh, it doesn't really happen when I put it on my back where I usually wear it. I'm able to keep it on for the three days, which is nice. But um, if I do see my mealtime blood sugars going a lot higher than what they should be based on doing a pre bolus at the right time and everything, I know it's a bad site. I'll change it out. I have a Frezza, so I'll usually take that. So I don't have mm -hmm. to wait for <laughs> wait for anything. It comes right on down. Yeah, the sites that don't seem to be absorbing are so frustrating. Mm -hmm. You know, you're doing all the things you're supposed to do. You know, you've counted your carbs like a good little soldier and you're bolusing and you're exercising and adjusting and it still doesn't work because the darn yeah. insulin's just sitting there. doesn't want to do its job. You know, it's. And then it finally hits and you crash down. Yeah. Yeah. That's just adding to the fun. Yeah. All right. So, so it was some great information. And is, is there any like one take home message you'd like to share with the listeners when it comes to managing their glucose while exercising? Um, I would want them to remember that exercise can be really helpful. You just need to learn the right strategies and have the right tools um, in order to make it enjoyable and not have diabetes mess with your workouts or make you feel like you're canceling them out because you're having to consume so much carb. Um, there's a way to do it where you don't need to eat all the calories you just burned. Nothing you can't do if you think like a pancreas, right? Exactly. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Catherine. I appreciate it. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. And as a reminder, Integrated Diabetes Services can assist you anywhere in the world with all, any aspect of your glucose management. We work, we work with people of all ages on self-management education, making use of the latest tools and technologies. And we have specialized programs in weight management, sports, pregnancy, emotional support, and we can offer our services in both English and Spanish. For more information, visit integrateddiabetes.com or send us an email to info at integrateddiabetes.com. So on behalf of Think Like a Pancreas, the podcast, I'm Gary Shiner. Have a great rest of your week.